I have seven o'clock, so I believe we can begin. I call this meeting to order, and if we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and the liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Sure. Mrs. Fryrick? Here. Mr. Posnow? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Here. Mr. Scalette? Mr. Scalette is absent tonight. Okay. Mrs. Schrader? Here. Mr. Sears? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Toman? Here. Hey, members present. Okay, thank you. Uh, this would be our first opportunity for public comment, if we could display. Does everybody have time to finish? So I will take that as a yes. I think that's the only comment. So uh, we have we have linked the uh, minutes of the planning committee meeting of April 12th, 2021. Unless anybody has any changes or corrections, I would offer them to be approved as they are posted. And Mr. Sears, Treasurer's Report. Thank you, Mr. Posnow. Um, as usual, I'll give you an interest update. $9,300 last month, way down from what we've been expecting, but that's because we're spending the tax revenue that we collected during the first part of the year and we're spending it. Tonight, we have a consent agenda. Would any board member like any of the items considered separately or are there any questions on any of the items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. Do I have a second? Second, Schrader. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this can be a unanimous roll call votes. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. The board met in executive session in a virtual meeting format prior to the planning committee meeting on April 12th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. is permitted by section 707 of the Sunshine Act for the purpose of discussing matters of personnel. No official action was taken. The board also met in executive session in virtual format on April 21st, 2021 as permitted by section 707 of the Sunshine Act for the purpose of discussing matters of personnel. Again, no official action was taken. And the planning committee meeting met on schedule, oh, the planning committee meeting scheduled on May 10th will start at 6.30 p.m. to allow recognition of retirees. So we'll start a half hour early and the regular monthly meeting of May 24th has been moved to May 25th and will be advertised that way due to a, con due to a conflict with graduation celebrations. The time will remain seven o'clock. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, you're muted. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight we have a couple of reports. Uh, first is from the Impact Foundation, which is a subset of the Education Foundation. Uh, Gina Trimmer is here tonight to 
to give us an update or help give us an update about what's going on with the Impact Foundation, the Student Run Impact Foundation. Gina. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Gina Trimmer, and I'm a board member with the York Suburban Education Foundation. I'm privileged to be the adult advisor for the Impact Foundation, which started in 2015, and it is a student-led committee of YSEF. Along with myself and 19 adult volunteers, 10 of whom work weekly, um, we have our teacher advisor, Kevin Wilson, that is helping with our mission of students helping students. We have 46 students this year on our board and have a few of them here this evening to update you on one of our major accomplishments this past year, IFS Food Pantry. Yes, we've transitioned what we had been doing for the past three and a half years um, of the Food for Thought Food Backpack program into a full pantry when COVID hit in March of 2020. Please watch this quick video of several of our students describing all the moving parts it takes to be able to help our families in need within the York Suburban School District. Janelle will share her screen now, thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Foundation Food Pantry is growing weekly. We fulfill on average 25 customized orders for those York Suburban School District families in need. Since we're in COVID times, we line up the boxes outside for each family to pick up at their designated time. This is a sample box of the refrigerated food donated by the York County Food Bank that I pack weekly for our family. The students help to stock the shelves so that we have a variety of foods that families can choose. The students help pack boxes of food, toiletries, and household items that the families have chosen from an online form. During the harvest season, we partner with Sprout of Hope. They provide us fresh food and vegetables to give us so that we can give families healthy food. The Impact Foundation students pack the orders and then the adult volunteers help <coughs> deliver to those families who can't come to the pantry. We transport two to six deliveries per week. We're grateful to the YSSD community for all their kind donations to help our families in need. Some of the donations are even large enough for us to break down and share amongst several families. Students sign up on a weekly basis to come help in the food pantry or closet. I love how it all comes together. Our grant writing committee has received several grants to help us provide the necessary food items for our Impact Foundation's Food Choice Pantry. We even have our alumni from the Impact Foundation return to donate goods to the pantry. Another fellow alum spearheaded a major donation drive at Penn State York to benefit the Impact Foundation Pantry. Books, books, who needs books? We thank our schools and United Way for donating books to the students in York's Suburban School District. When the weather cooperates, we put the books outside for families to take as many as they would like. The Impact Foundation puts our most needed items for the week on a whiteboard. This image is shared on our social media along with our Amazon wish list and our Target wish list. Thank you to everybody who donates and helps the families who depend on the pantry. We have an Amazon wish list that our community shops from and has the packages delivered right to us. These packages are what helps keep the shelves stocked with food, hygiene products, and toiletries. Thanks to all who donate. <laughs> Um, so I'm Janelle Rice and I am this year's president of the Impact Foundation and I'll be speaking about the changes that have occurred since we last spoke with you. Starting March of 2020, we began co collaborating with the York Suburban Drive-By Food Distribution from Whitson's and also began distributing 
distributing extra boxes of food items via the high school cafeteria. From there, we pulled all personal hygiene products and personal goods from the six school-based impact closets. With these items, we stocked our shelves at the pantry based at Luther Memorial Church. As we worked from the pantry, we added diapers and wipes to our inventory. We then later added fresh food products with the help of Sprout of Hope, the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, and the York County Food Bank. As you are all aware, at this time we were in the pandemic, so we had to get creative with how we completed our work. This included distributing products to our board members to work on remotely. Some of these projects were craft kits, um, there was book distribution and Easter baskets, and others were bagging laundry detergent pods or bagging underwear. I will now pass it on to Chrissy to talk about how we finance our work. Hi, my name is Chrissy. I'm the treasurer of the Impact Foundation. And as Janelle said, I'll be talking about more of our finances. Um, so as far as how we get food, since last March, we've received 35,550 pounds of food from the York County Food Bank and the Central PA Food Bank. Um, it was mostly free. Overall, the Impact Foundation has spent $348 at the food bank for additional purchases. Um, but the free food was mostly due to COVID, so we expect this to change as we come out of COVID. Um, our overall finances, uh, we currently have $64,200 in cash, um, which is an increase of $20,400 from this time last year. And we've been able to do this through a lot of grants. In May 2020, we received $2,000 from the Harvey Harley-Davidson Foundation. In October 2020, we received $12,300 from the State Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and this was to purchase commercial grade refrigeration and a freezer. So we bought a large unit in the fall for $8,200. And Natalie will talk more about what we're doing with the remaining money a little later. Um, and in November of 2020, CNS Wholesale Grocers gave us $1,000. Um, and in February 2021, we received $5,000 from the Warheim Foundation through the Central Penn Food Bank. And in April 2021, we received $15,000 from the Warheim Foundation through a private direct grant. Um, we've also received a lot of individual donations. So $2,500 came from anonymous gifts, $6,500 came from um, major gifts from two donors, and we've received hundreds of smaller gifts ranging from $5 to $600. So now I'll pass it on to Leona, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about who we serve. Hi, my name is Leona. I'm the Vice President of the Impact Foundation. Um, just to talk about a little bit of who we serve, all our money goes right back out to the York Suburban community. Since March of 2020, we have served 925 families, which is about 1,900 adults and 2,000 children. In March of 2020, we served about five to eight families per week when we first opened up our pantry. Now we serve 20 to 25 families per week. Each family gets about 30 pounds of food per week, in addition to household products, toiletries, and underwear. Uh, 30 pounds fits approximately into two two by three size boxes. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the video, but we had the boxes outlined outside. Each family gets about two to three of those. Uh, they were a bit smaller boxes than usual in the pictures. Each family, um, in addition to that, um, in March of this year, we also started a district impact closet um, in a second room in the Luther Memorial Church. Families can sign up for time slots. Uh, as scheduled times during our Thursday distributions. They can get clothes, shoes, beddings, towels, coats, boots, shoes, and a whole bunch more. Uh, we also take special, uh, special requests sorry, from Ms. Miranda King, our district social worker. Um, we've fulfilled needs of beds, mattresses, dressers, lamps, and lawnmowers. We haven't had a single request that we haven't been able to fulfill. Um, next, I'm going to pass it to Marcella, and she's going to explain a little bit more about how we pack the food. Hello, my name is Marcella Roll. I am a freshman in kind committee member, IF student committee member, and I'm going to speak to you about the weeks in our pantry. So throughout the week, email reminders and confirmations are sent to families, and the Impact Foundation receives the online order. 
on Tuesdays, students are printing and preparing the orders for distribution. And in the afternoon, about four to six students and one adult lead is present to pack orders. On Wednesdays, two to four students and two adult leads arrive to transport on average 800 pounds of food from the York County Food Bank to the pantry that need to be unloaded and stocked on the shelves. On Thursdays in the morning, one adult and one middle school student finish packing and make any final preparations. And on Thursdays in the morning, one adult and one middle school student finish packing and make final preparations. And in the um, afternoon, uh, which is our most active day, five adults and two to six students are there for student distribution or student food distribution and the district impact closet. Um, and how the Impact Foundation has impacted families is that we've had a long lasting customer who showed their gratitude by cooking us dinner. And not only did this show the significance of our foundation in this district, but also how we as people can observe how we can accompany each other as a community. Maria will now let you know how we get the items we distribute. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm a junior. This is my first year in the Impact Foundation, and I'm one of the major members of the In-Kind Collection Committee, and I'm also part of the Sunshine Committee. Um, like Marcella said, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we get our donations. Uh, as the video showed, we have a weekly social media we have weekly social media interactions to let the community know what we need in the pantry. And through that, we get an average of 11 to 14 drop-offs and packages sent to us weekly, which is really nice. Also, um, within IF, we have a committee called um, In-Kind Collections, as I mentioned before, where every two weeks, Marcella makes flyers with those needed items, which then get sent to five or different neighborhoods where we are collecting donations. Then once a month, a student in charge of overseeing those donations in a neighborhood gathers all these items and delivers them over to the pantry. We are grateful that most of the community donations that we receive are household essentials and personal hygiene items, which tend to be very expensive. Um, most of our packaged food comes from the Central Penn Food Bank and the York County Food Bank, while we get most of our fresh food, fresh food from the partner from partners like Proud of Hope. Um, now I'm passing on to Natalie, who's going to talk about our future plans. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Furman. I'm a senior, and this is my second year being the secretary of the Impact Foundation. While it's important to talk about what we've done so far, it's also important to focus on what we have planned for the future. We have a collaboration with the Luther Memorial Church to install an HVAC system. The Impact Foundation is in the process of working with the LMC volunteers to confirm the contractor. We are a serve safe qualified pantry which requires temperature control. There's $3,600 left of the state grant to purchase two more fridges and two more freezers. Expanding our collaborations with Sprout of Hope to plant more gardens at a business across the street from Yorkshire is prominent on our agenda. Um, now back to Janelle, our president. Um, we would like to open up for any questions you may have. While you're thinking, we'd like to show you our entire board of students who work tirelessly, tirelessly behind the scenes. So um, this is the... This is the uh, thank you card we shared to all of our donors. So if any questions, please. Uh, this is uh, Steve Sullivan. Are the students involved in putting together application materials for the grants, the grant writing process? Um, yes, we have a grant writing committee, which is led by Brooke Sargent, and uh, she spearheads a lot of our uh, grants. She also works with our grant writing advisor. Um, in previous years, Mrs. Tremor, I forget her name. Mrs. Sue Bowman. Helped, Mrs. Bowman, she's helped a lot throughout the years helping us to set up all the grants. In my past, I've written grants and uh, for, I've written the Harley Davidson grant and a few others. 
So the students definitely get involved in helping to write out all of our grants. Thank you. That's terrifically valuable experience. Yeah. Yeah, I would just like to, to say, you know, my thanks for all the hard work. Um, and I know the board appreciate it, uh, appreciates it very much. I um, follow you guys on social media and I saw the little blurb about, you know, the tractor for the gardening. It, it's just really a, a true community effort. And, and that just, you know, makes my heart proud that, that we have that kind of, uh, of united front for this, um, you know, community problem and a way to, to you know, work towards solving it. Um, and tagging on to what Steve said about the valuable experience, I mean, the list is long when it comes to uh, what the, the students are learning and the benefit that they're gaining from this experience. I hope when you guys get around to applying for colleges, you, you blow your own horn about that because that, that's just awesome. Wherever you go, you're gonna contribute to the community you're in and that's, that's big. So hats off. I know the board, uh, all the board members feel this way. So thanks very much to the advisors, the, the parents that are involved and certainly to the students. Yes, thank you very much, students. Thank you, Mrs. Trimmer. Uh, one thing I do want to point out about the Impact Foundation is that right from the outset, Mrs. Trimmer and company made sure that the students had those experiences of actually running an organization and actually running a foundation, which uh, not only do they do good things to the community, but they're also getting valuable experience they otherwise would never be able to have as a high school student. So thank you to all of you for all of your work. Thank you for how you work with Mrs. King. Uh, Ms. King and help her with what she needs to get done. Uh, just outstanding. We're, we're very grateful for your efforts. Thank you very much. And Thanks for allowing us to attend. You're welcome. And students, uh, if you have other work to do, go for it. Otherwise, we're happy to have you around for the rest of the meeting. So thank you very much. Um, also tonight, uh, we have the York County chapter of the Pennsylvania Association of School Retirees who would like to honor two of our employees for their work this past year. And I'll turn it over to Kathy Dalton. Well, actually, I'm Brenda Shear. This is Kathy Dalton. Uh, we are co-chairs of the um, Educational Support Committee for YCPASR. And part of our role is to, uh, each year we give two awards. Uh, they're called the Loretta Woodson Awards. Loretta Woodson was an educator who bequeathed money to PASR, Pennsylvania Association of School Retirees. And she stipulated that one of the awards, <clears throat> excuse me, goes to an educator and another to someone in a support staff of some sort for outstanding work that uh, they are doing. And we have been alternating through the school districts of York County, and this year it was York Suburban's turn. And Dr. Williams, um, the, the teacher that he, um, what's the word I want? Submitted. Submitted, okay, thank you, um, is Jennifer Hall, your art teacher at Yorkshire and East York. And these were the kind words that he had to say. Not only does Mrs. Hall perform well in her art classrooms, she reaches children outside of her classroom. She re recently illustrated a children's book, ABC That Sounds Like Me, a strength spotting alphabet book. The book is designed to help children realize their strengths and use them to better handle life. So Jennifer, those were the kind words that uh, Dr. Williams had to say about you. And then the other person is Wayne Ingerto in the maintenance department. And I have to say that this year is the first time that we ever had any, anyone in maintenance and we were thrilled. And this is what um, was written about him. With COVID-19, Mr. Ingerto has had to cope with ever-changing cleaning protocols. That alone is noteworthy, 
but he also took on a new role of presenting to and training his peers and subordinates in all things COVID. His efforts have allowed us to educate students. So those were the kind words said about you, Mr. Ingerto. So um, what they receive is, Kathy's holding up one of the plaques. You will get a very nice plaque from PASR, a small pin, and you will each get one of these, and then a check for $150 to be split among the two of you that um, you can use any way that you want to. Um, so we congratulate the two of you and um, you can be very proud of yourselves. Thank I think Kathy much. would like to say something else too. I would just like to express my thanks to Dr. Williams and his secretary, Wendy. Um, they were most helpful. Uh, any question I had, every time I called, they answered promptly and professionally. And when we were not able to have our luncheon, um, Dr. Williams came up with the idea of us presenting to the school board, which we greatly appreciated. Um, so it, it was a pleasure working with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for recognizing our staff. Really appreciate that. In case you don't know who we are, YCPASR is a group you may want to consider joining once you retire. Um, we meet four times a year and it's open to anyone who um, was employed by a school district, even associates. So husbands, wives, and so forth can also join. And um, we have me just me four meetings and we always have entertainment. And if we had been able to do this at one of our luncheons, we would have invited a musical group or theatrical group or something from your school district to come and entertain us that day. We, we average about 200 people at our, our luncheons. So, um, so since we couldn't do that, we're very just pleased that you allowed us to zoom in on, on tonight and, uh, and present these. These plaques and the check will be taken to the administration office and Wayne and Jennifer, um, you can pick them up there. Or maybe someone will deliver them to you, whatever. <laughs> I think they should deliver them, don't you? <laughs> I'd, I'd also Thank like you. to mention that our group presents two $2,000 scholarships every year to a high school senior. And we had the pleasure of doing that yesterday for one of the recipients. So this year's recipients were from Dover and from Central York School District. And they have to be going into education. That's one of the stipulations. And attending a Pennsylvania school. So. Very good. Okay, unless there are any questions, that's. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations, Jen and Wayne. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Wayne, you don't have any lessons to plan, but Jen, you might. And if, if you uh, feel free to, to leave if you need to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, for tonight's superintendent's report, uh, as we near the end of the academic year, we still find ourselves contending with the pandemic, as Mr. Inverto well knows. While our case counts have remained fairly consistent, the quarantine numbers have increased as we increase the number of in-person instructional days. Uh, safety protocols remain in place, which means that traditional year-end activities still need to be modified. Building administrators continue to look for creative ways to honor year-end traditions while abiding by the safety protocols. Of course, we're all looking forward to an unfettered return to in-person gatherings. Until then, we'll continue to try to make the best of the current conditions. Uh, tonight, uh, we heard from the Student Run Impact Foundation about the great work they do for our families. I'd like to thank them for the positive impact they have had in the York suburban community. Also tonight, we'll be hearing about the results of the Pennsylvania Youth Survey that is administered every two years. Dr. Krauser and Ms. King will share the results of the survey with you. But before that though, I wanted to share a few other things. Uh, first item I'd like to mention is that, that Dr. Krauser uh, kicked off the inaugural meeting of the steering committee that will develop a recommendation as to how we should proceed with facilities and program structure for the decades ahead, not just for the next couple of years, but for the long term. Uh, there are 32 members of the steering committee who will oversee the process of engaging feedback from various stakeholder groups. 
Uh, Dr. Krause will keep us up, updated each month uh, on the committee's progress, which also can be viewed on the uh, facilities page, uh, page set up for this purpose at www.ysd.org slash FFP. That URL will be in the superintendent's report that gets posted. Another item I'd like to mention is that uh, you all remember Bright Horizons uh, was a, an affiliation, a group we work with in the past, to provide uh, before and after school care and child care. Uh, we're currently in contract negotiations with the YWCA of York to provide those same kinds of services. Uh, we expect those services to be up and running um, approximately mid to late August. Um, also at the elementary level, I'd like to mention tonight that on the agenda, uh, we're pleased to recommend Mrs. Amanda Albright as Dr. Stoltz's replacement at Yorkshire. Mrs. Albright comes to us from Northeastern School District where she is a reading specialist and has, an, has been instrumental in their implementation of the multi-tiered system of support, MTSS. She's planning to spend a day at Yorkshire in early May to begin the process of getting to know the staff. And we look forward to working with Mrs. Albright and having her become part of the YS team. So that'll be on the agenda tonight and we can, uh, we, we can introduce her at that time. Um, also tonight, the last item I have is uh, in the superintendent's report, there have been some uh, inquiries about the attendance rate at our virtual meetings this year. Uh, and the, Mr. Henry provided the, the numbers. I'll have them in the posted superintendent's report. I'm not gonna run through the, the table of those num numbers, but it is very clear that um, attendance, if you wanna call it that, in, in the virtual aspect, uh, has increased dramatically uh, with online meetings. Uh, the numbers for each are, are for each meeting are listed in the table that's going to be posted in the, in the superintendent's report. Uh, the lowest number of concurrent viewers of our meetings has been 10, uh, and it peaked at 276. So at one point during one of our meetings during the year, we had 276 concurrent simultaneous attendees at our meetings. Of course, that was probably a meeting where we were talking about learning mode changes or something like that. So that would be the reason for the high attendance of that particular meeting. But to have the lowest number of participants at 10, I think is significant because many times we had, sometimes we have zero participants at in-person meetings. And also attached to the end of the superintendent's report is the uh, enrollment report. Uh, any questions on those items that I just mentioned? Okay, then I would like to turn it over to Dr. Krauser for the Pennsylvania Youth Survey information. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Dr. Williams mentioned, the PAYS or the Pennsylvania Youth Survey is administered every two years. Uh, it's administered in the sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grade years. Um, as I shared in the, in the fall, um, that process is, is, is really twofold. Number one, the data is used for us to uh, identify changes that we see in the patterns of use and abuse of harmful substances. And number two, we use that to assess the risk factors surrounding those behaviors. Um, our data this year um, on, on many counts in particular was showing an increased prevalence use in our, in our younger population of students in the sixth and eighth grade range. From that data, Mrs. King, at that time, Mrs. Hossifuss and now Mrs. Campbell and myself uh, really been analyzing that data and decided to take a deep dive at the student level in the Get Real Talks. If you recall in the fall, when we introduced that data point, uh, we shared a conversation that we were having with students. This evening, that data, that data talk, that Get Real Talk, uh, will be with middle school students. So I'm gonna get the video ready to go and I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. King uh, for her brief introduction. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me. I love when I get the opportunity to sit down and chat with all of you. Um, we were really hoping that this session of Get Real could be in person. Um, we actually were able to um, like have the room at, in the Roots and Wings classroom. Unfortunately, that day, the entire middle school had to go virtual. So we had to rely on um, going Zoom because uh, the approach that we took this time is kind of a, um, an addition to the previous video. So we talked a little bit about drugs and alcohol and the prevalence of it. And this comes from 
the lens of prevention. We obviously know our, all of our numbers are uh, considerably rising. So I wanted to get the student feedback on what they need and what they're missing um, that we could incorporate, you know, in their future future years here at, at York Suburban. So go ahead, Dr. Krauser, you can play the video. So we by far got the most feedback from our seventh graders. Um, our eighth graders were kind of pretty numb to the topic, which, you know, really kind of hits home that I think they don't always have that safe space to talk about it openly. Um, and then our sixth graders were also, you know, pretty vulnerable about knowing that it exists, where it's at, but they are all craving that person-to-person -person interaction um, beyond just kind of learning the content in health and then you know, taking a test on it. They really crave um, talking about how they feel and connecting, you know, why they may decide to use also that peer pressure, that interaction to, to make choices that they wouldn't otherwise make. Um, and if I may, just to segue a little, I think it really connects with what I'm seeing in the district as a whole, um, as quickly as our drug and alcohol concerns are, are rising and increasing, um, we're seeing significant um, probably the worst I've ever seen in my career um, of mental health declining. Um, so it, it, you know, it works hand in hand that a lot of our students are self-medicating, finding other ways to cope, to fit in, to feel better. Um, you know, because like I said, the mental health is just um, at an all time high um, within our walls and every, every grade K to 12. So my hope in the years moving forward is to come from that prevention lens to really hear the student voice and provide exactly what they need and what they're looking for to be successful. Um, but, you know, anytime I get the opportunity to speak with all of you, I really like to give you the truth. Um, and, and the truth is our kids are, are not doing well um, from a mental health perspective. You know, just last week alone, I think I had four kids in the same day with active self-harm. Um, and, you know, when they don't have a place to go or a mental health professional to see, they're going to, you know, gravitate towards those substances to kind of just escape and avoid. Um, you know, so I always rely on your expertise and your voices to really rally around um, why those supports are, are so important. So thank you. I'll, I'll open it up if you have any questions. Brandon, just, came, just quick, quick, oh. 
Uh, could you talk just a little bit, maybe some more detail about self-medication? And I know you're saying that, that our kids are in trouble, and I agree with that. Uh, four kids is certainly significant, but four or 3,000 doesn't really tell the story. Just how broad-based is the problem? I mean, vaping is an epidemic in, within all of our buildings. Um, vaping at school, vaping at the bus stops. Um, not only is it just nicotine, but you can almost put any kind of substance in that, you know, dab pen, vape pen. They're very concealable, they're hideable. Um, I have an, a huge number of kids, um, and again, protecting confidentiality, that come in to see me that um, are smoking pot daily, before school, after school, um, social gatherings with friends. Um, it's just becoming a release, um, alcohol, um, to just really escape some of the issues that they're facing. Um, when you are a teenager, you're already incredibly impressionable. And then when you don't have that day-to-day -day interaction, that's normal for growth and development, you're going to seek towards those things that give you that comfort and that release, um, which typically is, uh, marijuana and alcohol for, um, teenagers and young adults. Can you give us some sense of, of just how prevalent it is? like numbers <laughs> well, numbers percentage um i didn't look back at our like the, the last pays data um and i would have to track you know specific disciplinary referrals but um i would say loosely half of our student body um even into our middle school again the, the what was most alarming in, in the data is the age of which mm -hmm. students were experimenting gets younger and younger um and it kind of goes hand in hand with the data that I know Dr. Rodenberg presented to you um, last week on how the kids are struggling and what they're doing to cope. Um, so I would loosely estimate um, half of our student body has either experimented with some sort of drugs and alcohol or are actively using um, as they get into high school. When you have conversations with them, does the subject of legality enter in? Um, not necessarily, because I don't think we really come from a place of harm reduction. Um, I think it's more just that disciplinary referral, but we don't really seek to find the underlying cause of why that student is using. Nine times out of 10, there's household dysfunction. Um, it's normalized within the household. A parent or guardian or older sibling is also using, um, and they just don't have that you know, ability to treatment, whether it's an insurance barrier, funding. Um, I can't get kids in anywhere for any kind of treatment, let alone a dual diagnosis program where they get the mental health and the drug and alcohol treatment. Um, so it's, it's really like we're in this kind of endless spiral. So I'm really trying to figure out how holistically can we educate sooner and better to really kind of hit home um, that they don't have to go that route um, to, to, to feel better about themselves. Do you think they understand that what they're doing is illegal? And does that matter? I think they know that it is illegal, but I think how they feel and just the escape from what they're going through, it becomes um, invalid. That's not the, the, that's the least of their concern until they actually have um, significant legal issues. And I'll just give you a quick example. I worked almost this entire year to really encourage one of our students to um, get into treatment. I came from a prevention focus before it kind of got to the place where it was really, really bad. And it took getting legal involved, courts involved, issuing warrants um, to really get that kid agreeable to treatment, despite, you know, that kind of slow decline. Um, and and it, that's more and more often, you know, that I'm unfortunately seeing kids kind of get to that space where then it's, it's you know, um, court ordered. And then they don't always kind of take it as serious because they're saying, hey, you have to do this in order to get this to occur or your record to get expunged or um because we don't come from, again, that, that, you know, restorative place and the harm reduction place. Um, it's a really tricky limbo, if you will. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Mr. Sanders, you have a question, I think. I, I do. So you, you mentioned uh, you have these kids coming in to see you. Is that, is that they're, they're coming in voluntarily or, or kind of what, how are you gathering this information or how are you noticing that there's issues going on? So it's a mixture. Um, a lot of times I still get referrals from our counselors who um, don't know where to send them, where do you get help, if it's a specialized treatment, if a kid is an act, act, you know, addiction, um, typically you have to have some sort of detox or treatment or you know, what is the best fit for whatever that kid is experiencing. Um, it is rare 
rare that I get out of my office at the high school anymore be, due to the number of volume, you know, that kids are just popping in to see me. Um, I created a safe space. I always have chocolate and candy and I got different low lighting to give kids a space to just unload. And it takes more than one meeting often until they actually give me like the root cause of what's occurring. Um, sometimes it's a referral from the office. Hey, we got this kiddo. They're coming in for A, B, C, D, and E. Um, oftentimes I have parents that will reach out. It really is coming from everywhere in the community. And then you mentioned you're dealing with a lot of high school kids, 14, 14 plus year olds. The rules are a little bit different for 14 plus year olds, if I understand the law correctly. Yeah. Do, you, do you find that to be a, um, a hindrance to your ability to help those kids get treatment or not? Um, yes and no. Um, I think at that age group, I wish they didn't have all of the decision-making power in some of those situations because I don't think they really realize the magnitude of the choices and decisions they're making, but we've been given them the legal authority to decide. Um, you, you know, so, but then again, I also have, you know, parents who don't consent to their children's treatment. And I like that they do have the option to then decide for themselves. So it really goes on a case by case basis um, when that barrier comes into play. Same with younger kids. Um, the youngest, this was the first time that I had a, a kindergartner that I had to send to a residential treatment facility. Um, and it's challenging because, you know, you want to try those least restrictive options for treatment, um, you know, and when the system doesn't necessarily go the way that it should, or you have a parent that is, you know, avoidant or more in denial about what their kid is experiencing and going through, trying to normalize that talk around drugs and alcohol and mental health and kind of how they all, you know, fit in that puzzle together, um, you know, was really helpful coming from that psycho ed piece, um, which is why I'm hopeful to get back into my let's talk sessions with parents um, to really give them the knowledge they need to, to better help um, their, their students and family. Okay, thank you. Sure. Ms. King, I have a question if I may. Sure. <laughs> Given the volume, the increase in volume that you're seeing, coupled with the, the data that Dr. Rodenberg provided last week, are there adequate treatment options available to the students that are coming in to see you? But I mean, from external agencies or healthcare organizations? No. Um... And we had talked about that at, at the group that we attend. You know, it's it's absolutely unacceptable that I have a middle schooler sitting for 10 hours in the emergency room waiting to be evaluated. Um, I sent a kid to crisis today and the clinician would not evaluate because they close at four and the eval takes longer than an hour and she showed up at three. So the wait list to get a kid into partial right now um, is eight kids, 10 kids long. Um, majority of the sessions are virtual like this and it's really hard to do therapy um, and really connect with a young adult through a computer screen because they're craving that connection. So um, it's a systemic issue, um, but I, I do and am very hopeful that we can figure out a way in-house to really better support um, our student needs to avoid those inpatient stays, those trips to crisis, the self-harming behavior. But um, I need the system to rally around that as well, which is why I'm always a part of those conversations with Wellspan um, and creating new innovative things um, to make sure students are getting the, the things that they need in the community. But no, we are not at all equipped um, for mental health, but in a pandemic, I don't think none of us ever expected to experience that. So we're even more crippled, if you will, um, because the need is so vast for every everybody. So from your professional perspective, uh, to date, you haven't seen any developments uh, from these, these external agencies or institutions or organizations that would give you confidence that we could handle this adequately for the foreseeable future? Is that safe to say? Um, yes. I, as hopeful as I get that things will start to change, it feels like we remain stagnant or there's promises made that we'll do A, B, C, and D and we still stay at stage A. Um, I'm really waiting for like the words to be taken into action. Um, one agency that I am a little bit happier with is MHIDD and their school-based mental health liaisons. 
um, having her in place has been been helpful um, with reaching out to more families, providing more support, making more referrals. But um, that system is also incredibly overwhelmed uh, with the need. So, Rich, unless you can hire like six more social workers, four more psychologists, like, <laughs> um, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can. But in reality, you know, it's in order for things to change, we have to put that money in prevention. And it's often hard to get agencies and even school systems to kind of come from that lens because you're really looking at a what if, like you're not necessarily guaranteed an outcome when you look through that prevention lens, which, which makes it sometimes difficult. Thank you very much. If I win the lottery, I'll call you first. Uh, okay. <laughs> Miranda Ellen, um, do you see a lot of issues with the older brothers and, or sisters or even parents having such an influence on the younger children that you know what's going to happen to the younger children and they're going to go into the same spiraling out of control. I mean, and then all of a sudden you got a whole family to. Yeah. Um, and, and I've come from a proactive approach. Um, I'm hoping to, you know, come up with some really new innovative ideas this summer that we can carry into next school year and beyond um, of having quarterly or monthly meetings with that exact situation you're talking about, Ellen, when we have, you know, kids across districts and many different grade levels making sure administrators and counselors and staff in each of those buildings are all talking the same language on the same page. Again, from a prevention standpoint, so that, you know, the kid in second grade doesn't end up in the same position that the kid in 10th grade is in now. Um, also to help re reduce some of that systemic poverty um, that we're working to empower and enable our families versus just kind of giving that handoff, that how can we ch make that systemic change so that the kids and families that are coming through um, learn to, to kind of function and manage a little bit a little bit different. Do parents where there are multiple siblings with issues, are they in the main help, you know, appreciative or helpful or understand that they have this crisis going on in their families? I mean, it's, it's a 50 50. Um, I have families that I've worked with since I've been here for three years and we are exactly at the same spot three years later. And then I have families that, you know, you give a simple leg up or a simple referral or connection to a resource and, and they are thriving. Um, so again, it's really individually based. I really work with our families on normalizing, empowering, you know, the situation that you're in does not have to be long-term. It it's temporary. We all experience hardship. I'm sure every one of us on the screen has experienced something in life that they thought they couldn't get over or fix or resolve. You know, my job is to help give them the skills and the resources to do better. Um, and then, you know, some families take it and run with it and others require, um, you know, that kind of consistent handholding. And then at that time, I don't have it within my capacity from a time standpoint to really do what needs to be done, where then I rely on, you know, some of those other community providers to really enmesh with that family, um, you know, to accomplish the things they need to accomplish. Thank and then you. there's times where the children just aren't safe. Um, the number of children and youth mm -hmm. referrals that I've had to make the last several months is e extreme. Um, the number of kiddos that have been coming in from foster care. So, um, you know, I really see all ends of the spectrum, if you will. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what it is appropriate in terms of our ESSA money, but I think would be money well spent if we have some of that, you know, money from the federal government that could be channeled toward some of these mental health issues. I mean, sort of speaking to that first um, public comment that we had uh, also speaking to this topic that if we could use some of that money toward getting some help for um, Miranda or the, you know, mental health issues that we have, that would be ideal. So. And just to piggyback on that, we have come up with some creative, I have been in this field for over 10 years, not school social work, but social work. So I do have a lot of connection in the communities with my friends who are providers and we've utilized some poly fund money, um, things like that to help a kid get the specialty treatment that they need because their insurance won't cover it or they don't have insurance or they're not eligible for insurance. Um, and they give us a reduced rate, sliding scale fees, really working to how can we just help this kid get to the next day. Um, has been really awesome watching that collaboration. The Impact Foundation has really reduced the load when it comes to food insecurity. 
um, by redeveloping that system, they have a better means to help support, um, you know, those needs of those families where I'm not, you know, out delivering meals all the time. Um, so we've really tried to think of creative ways that are affordable and, you know, long lasting to connect some of our needier families to services. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Mrs. King. Just just briefly to to comment to Mr. Sears point, I'm just going to share my screen here to share the the data that I shared uh, when Mrs. King and I, Ms. King and I were in in October um, to kind of highlight those percentages we were talking about with that early initiation and really focusing on these increases that we were seeing down here in the younger grades in the six through eight um, and that get real and those talk conversations to get a better sense of exactly what was occurring with those students so that we could implement some of the strategies that Ms. King was referring to, um, to really address what we're seeing here with this greater than 40% increase on alcohol, as, as well as what we were seeing with the marijuana use as these students were moving through the system. Um, and just to kind of review of what we had shared at the beginning of that uh, October when we started that kickoff. So to, to your point, Mr. Sears, uh, yeah, absolutely. We use the, the numbers and the data we got back from, from the pay survey, uh, again, from 2019, but really decided to take a focus on conversations with students um, to take into fact their honesty in those, in those transparent meetings when they were kind of giving us those direct communications so we can start to make the interventions occur earlier um, and hopefully more effective. Thank you for that, Scott. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. King, thank you very much. Dr. Grasser, thank you. Thank and you. that concludes the superintendent's report. All right, thanks. Um, Ms. Chichuli, business office. Good evening. I have one consent agenda. You have before you the business office report, which includes items one through five. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately? Or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, I would ask that a motion be made to approve the below mentioned items. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on number three, where we, we're, at, we're going to deny the request to waive the $322 penalty. Um, th this is the second time we've had somebody who's had trouble with communications with tax collectors or with whatever, not getting the proper information. I'm having a little bit of a problem with that. Um, anything that we, we can do, um, this doesn't leave a very good taste in somebody's mouth when we say to them for $322, they're willing to pay the bill that's owed. Um, are, are we working to make sure that, and I, I'm sure it's not our responsibility, but then we do a lot of things that are not our responsibility in the school district to make sure people do get these notifications or the mailings or is there anything that can be done, I guess, I'm asking. Um, well, I'm not sure how much I can share, but um, the tax collector has resigned, um, yeah. and so that's a vacant position. Um, and as far as the tax bill itself, the tax law does state that regardless of whether or not the uh, taxpayer receives their uh, tax bill, they are responsible for ensuring that they receive their tax bill. Um, all I can say is that the, the uh, taxes are mailed um, on, a regular, on, on a regular schedule. They go out in July. Um, if you've been a resident in, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, it ranges from July 1st to August 15th. And then in November, you will typically receive a reminder letter and in December would be the end of the tax season. Um, so if you're just newly into Pen uh, as a resident into Pennsylvania, then I could understand and missing the deadline. Um, but it would then re be your responsibility to contact that tax collector or even contact the school district and the school district will um, guide the tax the taxpayer in the right way. Uh, you know, um, I, I just feel badly. People are moving into the district. You know, it's kind of like, you know, registration, you know. People wait until two weeks after school has started. We don't penalize them necessarily for showing up with their children to register them. And you would think everybody would know about that. Um, I'm just having a little bit of a problem with that. That's all. I don't know how the rest of my uh, fellow board members might feel about this. Ellen, if I could chime in there. Uh, unfortunately, you become a victim of the services that you hire to change title and to, and to work with you on a real estate transaction. There are so many checks and balances that, that should be uh, looked at when you are buying or selling real estate. 
And if your title company is not go going to bring that to your attention, that's the first, that's the first organization you should be going back to and talking with, especially when you're doing a transaction right around tax time. Title companies should make those clients aware of exactly what bills are forthcoming and not forthcoming. To come back to us and say, and you know, and request, I mean, we're almost the, the last resort. I mean, we give plenty of notice. It's, it's not like this changes on a year in, year out basis. I, I, I don't disagree with you, but you know, you don't know what you don't know if you don't get it. Do, do you know what I'm saying, James? You just. I, 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 I'm with you. I, I just, unfortunately, it's, I don't even know if this is a tax collector issue. This is, you know, you've got, you've really got to go back to the people that did the work for you. That, that's, that's the problem here. I understand what you're saying, Ellen, and, and I, I feel some sympathy towards the, 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 the person who got stuck here with this bill. Unfortunately, I don't think we can make, you know, every case is different. And the, the precedent that's always been set uh, is that we deny these requests. And I think we have to stick to that or else we're going to get a million of them. And a lot of them aren't going to have any justification. And we won't be able to sort those out. And, and unfortunately, you know, th this one might have a good solid rationale. We just can't, we don't have the time or the energy to be in the business of sorting that out. And so we just have to stick with the precedent that we've set. So, so Ellen, am I hearing that you have a discomfort with a consent agenda for one through five? You're muted. I just wanted to see how others thought about this. You know, um, I, I guess that ultimately these people will pay the bill or they won't or whatever. You know, I don't want to see anybody in trouble over three hundred and twenty-two dollars. But um, uh, I'm willing. We, I know in the past we have denied these, uh, but we don't always know about them. Sometimes you just hear kind of about them. You know, and every once in a while. Actually, is this the second or third time this year we've gotten one, Mr. Chili? I think. Yes, it's it's the third one that I've brought to the board. You know, um, so it's kind of, um, as long as we're consistent, that's all. I'll, I'll, I'll support it, but I, I think it's something we need to think about. So can I, uh, can I have a motion that, that supports the consent agenda of items one through five? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just wonder, uh, Kathy, could you confirm which township this request is the resident? In which Spring county? Garden. Thank you. Other? Then I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Um, I will share my screen to go through the informational section. Do you see the food service report before you? No. Okay. Um, so we've been showing you on a monthly basis the food service report and how we're operating. And up until a couple months ago, uh, maybe February, we were running in a deficit. Um, and you'll see that we've collected uh, revenues um, of a total of $694,000 with expenditures at uh, $672,000 um, with a small surplus of uh, 21544 In the month of March, we realized a surplus of $59,000, which has been our largest surplus this year. Um, and there were just two main components of that. One is payroll and benefits. Since the start of COVID, we have been short-staffed in, um, in our cafeterias. Um, but at the beginning of the school year, that really didn't present itself as an issue since we didn't have 100% of the kids. Um, and so as we're moving into uh, five days instruction for all, we have been hiring um, and, and recruiting. 
The second component of that surplus is uh, bringing elementary students back five days a week. Um, and so we did really see um, that impact. On the second page of this report, you'll see the breakdown of revenues and expenditures by month. Um, and you can see that we started having a small surplus in November, but and then in February, we had a bit of a bad month. Um, and that was really due to uh, February being a short month. Um, and then I just explained March. The last slide is, has been our uh, participation and the meals that we've served um, throughout this school year compared to 1920. And we still are serving all students free meals. Um, and we'll continue to do that throughout the school year and throughout the summer. Uh, we did hear that the USDA has approved um, that the waiver continue through the 21-22 school year, but we have not received any guidance from PDE as of yet. Are there any questions on the food service report? Okay. Moving on to the uh, year-to-date um, budget. Um, another report that I have been providing on a monthly basis is our year-to-date budget and showing you how we're performing as far as revenues and expenditures are concerned. Um, so year-to-date, our revenues are, uh, we've received 88.3% of the total budgeted revenues that, we've, um, that we have. And then our expenditures are at 68.39% of what we've budgeted. So a couple of highlights on the revenue side, uh, we've collected 97% uh, of our uh, real estate uh, revenues. Um, if you recall, during the development of the 2021 budget, we were concerned with the economic downturn due to the pandemic. And as a result, there were certain areas that we uh, decrease or reduced um, as far as revenues and it was concerned. Uh, real estate was one of them. We had budgeted at 96%. However, uh, we didn't really see an impact in real estate taxes. EIT is a, the second largest local source uh, that we have. Um, and this we budgeted 17% uh, lower than in previous years. Um, but currently we are running about $91,736 ahead of 1920. And so we anticipate that this will continue. Now, having said that, we do have bad months um, as well. Um, but in looking at our trends that we've experienced uh, throughout this year, um, even in the pandemic, we're anticipating that this area will be favorable to the district. There are areas in the local revenues that are down um, from prior year, and that is interim taxes, delinquent taxes, and game receipts. Um, we haven't uh, had any uh, game receipts, and so we won't see any revenues in that area. As far as state and federal, we're on track um, to what we've budgeted. On the expenditure side, we, um, as I mentioned, we've expended 68% of our budget, um, which is on pace with what we've done in the past. We still have some significant uh, costs that are coming up. We have met 93% of our budget for cyber charter uh, tuition, and we still have two months of billing to go. Um, we still have IU costs, transportation, with transportation, we are anticipating a savings of about $163,000, um, and that was because for uh, the majority of the year, we didn't operate on Wednesdays, or at least we didn't have uh, in-person instruction. We have uh, several bond payments coming up in May and June, um, and so we still have those obligations. And then we currently have over $900,000 in open purchase orders. Um, but overall, um, as I look at the trends and looking at, look at our spending patterns, um, I believe that we're on track and there aren't any major concerns. Any questions in this area? Okay. The last report that I wanted to share with you is on COVID expenses. The last time that I showed you 
of COVID expenses was in February, which were revenues uh, and expenditures received through January 31st. And so since then, we've received 33,000 uh, more in revenues. And that is mostly in the area of the ESSA um, funds and um, the special education, which is the 260. 216,000 and then the 5,614. So those are the two areas that increased from uh, the prior time. On the expenditure side, we did increase for about $161,829. Um, and that's really, again, on the ESSA side, as we go through the year, a lot of this money was set aside for top development um, of our in-house cyber program. Um, we do have ongoing overtime and custodial services. And then th we had uh, some district-wide supplies. And this ranges from um, equipment for the top program to uh, buying PPE stuff and, and things like that of 95,000. We've been fortunate that as new grants come along, um, that some of the money that we had previously expended that have been above the, the initial COVID grants, we've been able to apply. One of the examples of that is the PCCD number two. Um, that wasn't any new money that we spent. That was, we took that funding and absorbed some of the prior um, bills that we had uh, for COVID. Overall, currently, the impact over the grant is $283,706. Um, and I do really uh, have to commend um, Dr. Krauser, Dr. Kettleman, and all the principals who have really uh, controlled uh, the COVID expenses. Um, we had anticipated over a million dollars above the grant money that we received. Um, and this just goes, goes to show that they have been diligent um, and uh, cognizant of the financials. And so I'd like to thank all of them for, for their assistance as well. Are there any questions on the COVID expenses? Yeah, Kathy, looking at the, and thanks for providing this report. So going into our budgeting, you know, continuing with our budgeting process for next year, can you remind me again how much of the expense related to COVID is, is in our budget for next fiscal year? We didn't really budget anything new as far the way that we did this year um, with the additional PPE stuff and uh, Chromebooks and things like that. We are utilizing um, SF money, the ESSA 2 money, which is $1.3 million. Um, and that what we're doing is because we cannot apply that directly to things like cyber charter tuition increase, which is an increase um, directly related to COVID, uh, we're using that money to fund top programs, uh, the top program and the top of continuation of the top development. Um, we're also using that for some learning loss during the uh, summer months. Um, we're trying to bring back some students um, and giving them some support for, um, for some help that they, they may have may need because of you know, the pandemic. Um, so some, those are some of the areas that we're looking at um, as we head into SF3 monies we are looking at you know, what we can do, again, to address social emotional learning. Um, we also want to look at uh, learning loss in that area. Um, and so that's, we're currently in the planning stages for that grant. Okay, so apologies, and, and we're, I know we're, we're kind of an alphabet soup here of programs. And for people that you know, are online listening to what we're talking about here, if you could make it real simple, of the $909,000 that was spent on COVID-related expenditures, how much of that $909,000 dollar-wise or percentage-wise, if you don't have it, ballpark, is in next year's budget? I would say, I would say about 50%. It's, it's not to the same extent that we did this year. So we've got about $450,000 in next year's budget related to incremental spend because of COVID issues. Yes. Okay. Is there any opportunity 
um, and and I, I think you may have said it, but there was a lot of a lot of program uh, uh, stuff that you were talking about there. Is there any opportunity to cover that with grant money? In other words, is it neutral to the budget next year? We have one point three million dollars that we'll be receiving that is included in the budget. Okay, so one point three million less the four fifty. So we have an incremental. Um, uh, sorry, my brain's not working. $900,000 of, of grant money to utilize for COVID related stuff. Well, all of it is COVID related. It's just how we use it. There's a lot of flexibility on how we use it. We could use it for staffing. We could use it for more equipment. We could use it for replacing HVACs. So we've chose to use it to balance the budget and that balancing the budget includes the, the continuation of the top program um, and paying for some curriculum for some learning loss as well. The full 1.3 million you're talking about, the full right? The 1.3 million will be used. Okay, is there any opportunity to, as, as we get further and further away, hopefully from, uh, from COVID impact, to lessen the 450 over time? The 450 expense is what I'm referring to. The majority of that is for top, um, depending on you know, how far we can get with uh, the use of federal funds to continue to develop that, because I don't think that we want to move away from it. Um, so it depends on you know, how far we get with, with that amount of money for 21, 22, and how much in 22, 23 we'll be able to use to continue that program. That's really where I'm going with this is the multi-year is that 450, does it, does it lessen over time or, or you know, I, I guess I just, I wanna make sure we have some visibility on this because if, if it is for top, then, then that's an opportunity to bring funds back into the district, right? But right. if it's for other things like overtime related to extra cleaning and or, you know, a lot of the other items that are outside of top, then, uh, you know, how are we addressing that to, you know, uh, minimize that impact over time? And, and yeah, I'm, I'm not asking for an answer. I'm just, I'm, I'm calling mm -hmm. it out. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Well, Kathy, it's Joel. Just Tennessee. focusing on the York County grant for a minute. What, yes. what, are, what are the mechanics of utilizing that money? 500,000 granted, 50,000 to date, if I'm reading it correctly. We, so there's 450 remaining. Oh, I'm grant. sorry, Mr. Sears. I have an extra zero in that number. That it's, makes it's a huge 50, difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wish it was 500,000. Yep. You can, see where, you can see where my concern came from. Yes, I, I do apologize. That, that's an extra zero. We only received 50000 and that went straight into some extra cost courses for top. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll correct it before I post it. Okay, if there are no other questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Ms. Bowen, how are you tonight? Hi everyone, I'm doing good. Um, I'd like to start off by saying student council elections have come to a close. And so that means uh, a new student school board representative. So I'm sure she'll be joining us at some point soon, but she is Neve Casey and she's an upcoming junior and she'll be filling in my spot eventually. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to introduce her to all of you and I'm sure she's eager to begin as well. Aside from this, the Trojan Theater Club put, um, put on Lend Me a Tenor this weekend um, as their spring play and from what I've heard it was a huge success and a, an amazing show. Um, also, PSSAs, Keystones, and AP testing are all coming up very soon for everyone. So it's prime time for prepping, um, especially in the high school, I know that. So with that being said, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you.
All right, uh, we have a link to committee reports here and I will fill in for Mr. Scalette. Uh, you've got the minutes of the February 16th Academic Standards and Curriculum Committee meeting. And following the discussion at that committee meeting, the committee recommends the approval of the limited expansion of concurrent dual enrollment for high school students. And I guess the committee would ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Questions or comments? Then I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, Personnel Committee. Thank you, Mr. Pose. Now, you have before you the personnel report, which includes employment, extracurricular, leave of absence, and volunteers. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately? Or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Could somebody sort of compare and contrast uh, department leaders and content coordinators? I see in some cases, they're the same person, but in other cases they are not. I'm just curious what roles and responsibilities each category would might entail. Sure, if I can ask Dr. Krauser and Dr. Ketterman uh, to yep. provide. I would be happy to to respond to that. Um, it's two two part. Um, historically, we've had one role of a department leader, which really held the just the management factor of of a department. As we moved through the high quality teaching learning initiative that came out of the comprehensive plan and our increased emphasis on curriculum, curriculum development, and using the understanding by design framework, we see we saw an immediate need for greater uh, attention to the supporting of content, uh, both horizontally within a department as well as vertically. Um, so the creation of the content coordinators was uh, basically took the position, which was just a department chair to spread that out uh, with two, two purposes in mind. One to focus on uh, having roles and responsibilities tied to, to curriculum, curriculum development, curriculum conversations, collaborations, somewhat separate from the management of meeting minutes, uh, submission of uh, budgetary items and, and having that more from a management end to open up. The second reason was to uh, create more collaboration and more leadership opportunities within the departments. So in some departments we saw, and the third was to increase more of that opportunity in the elementary, elementary division. In some departments, we opened that up to the entire district and it had a, a series of interview processes and every teacher was eligible to apply for those positions. And then myself, Dr. Ketterman and the principals conducted interviews for those positions. In some positions, uh, there was only one applicant. In some positions, there was one applicant for both positions. In some, in some cases, there was multiple applicants for multiple positions. Uh, and in some cases, there were no applications for certain positions. So that's kind of why you see in, in some cases, one person from the department may have applied for both and it directly a choosing to accept the roles and the responsibilities that are tied to both of those um, positions, separating them out from content and management. Dr. Ketterman, I don't know if you want to add to that. Either Dr. Ketterman's muted or she doesn't. Okay. <laughs> did did that, Lois Ann, did that answer your question? It, it does. I just was curious. So we can therefore conclude when it's the same person that perhaps there was limited interest within that particular group to participate. I really like the idea of spreading spreading the wealth. And I'm not talking about the stipend involved, but just leadership and things like that. I, I really like that. Co correct. And there were some cases where we had multiple people apply, um, but given the expertise of each person uh, with administration, we chose which individuals would accept it. But to your point exactly was the idea to create greater opportunities for staff members to get involved in leadership 
and and share the wealth both in the in the role of responsibilities to get at the heart of curriculum that takes time um, and energy that's done outside of the school and here's a way to compensate them for that work that um, is is the right work is purposeful work uh, but they are two responsibilities right I, I am right that there's no no neither of these categories have supervisory responsibilities no one goes in and observes a peer not in a supervisory opportunity, um, but we do have certain departments that are, are very collaborative by nature, and they do offer and welcome um, collaboration across their departments. So colleagues come in and offer uh, support, encouragement, and or help analyze lessons. And I, and I would say, you know, that's probably one of our goals in the future, that we get much more into that lesson design type of work, where you have a collaborative team analyzing one another's lessons, not in a supervisory way, but uh, in an improvement process, how do we make this particular lesson become more effective um, and more authentic for our students? So we do have that existing in certain classes uh, and certain buildings where we have teams of teachers that go in and observe one another, but very peer oriented, uh, which is at the heart of what we would much rather have versus supervisory. Right. A non-threatening, supportive role. Absolutely. OK, thank, thanks very much. I was curious about that. So I appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Krauser. Couldn't have put that explanation any better myself. Absolutely, sir. Other questions? Uh, is the compensation for the curriculum coordinators new to the budget? It, a... it's, a, it's, a, it's a small addition. Um, what we ha have done was taken the department chair, which was a greater number, and split that number to increase the number of individuals. So what may have been $2,400 for a one role, we now split it across two roles. And in that slight adjustment, we're able to add more members to the team. Um, I believe, uh, and I'll, I'll look to, to Mrs. Chichuli, but I believe it was a small increase um, of a couple thousand dollars. And this year we had some positions that went unfilled. So I think the number is even smaller than I originally had planned when I did my math. Thank you. There, there are about three positions that were unfilled, but um, overall, the increase was less than 8,000. Other questions? So I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous vote call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. That concludes my report. Thank you. Mr. Toman, policy review. Mr. Toman, can I jump in for a second, uh, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Go Thank ahead. you very much. Uh, I'd like to mention that tonight uh, on, the, on the call, we have Ms. Mrs. Albright with us, who is our New Yorkshire principal who was just uh, approved a few minutes ago. And uh, Mrs. Albright, would you like to say anything? I absolutely would, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here tonight and just to join this fantastic team. A little emotional because I'm super excited, um, but my family and I are excited for this new adventure. Um, and I just appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in person someday and just welcoming you into Yorkshire. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank welcome, you. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toman. Thank you, and welcome aboard. Um, the policy review committee, uh, we have eight policies that uh, will be brought forward to this committee for vote uh, in May, uh, and they're listed there. We are on our first read. Uh, you've seen these before at two previous meetings. Uh, and we'll see them again at the May 10th meeting. And we will, I believe, have a final vote then at the May 25th meeting, if I'm correct. Um, are there any questions on any of the eight policies? Hearing none, I am complete. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robinson, how's the legislative world doing? Uh, thank you for asking, Mr. Pose. Now, informed sources are saying that the buzz in Harrisburg indicates that this might actually be the year when some kind of charter reform 
may actually occur. But to make sure this is a certainty, uh, we need to enlist the support of all our fellow citizens to contact their local elected representatives to voice their opinion on the issue of charter reform. So for anybody listening in tonight, I would urge you to contact your local officials to urge the positive direction for charter reform. On a more mundane note, uh, two bills in the Senate are receiving attention. Senate 312, which would permit school districts to charge fees for any solicitations for information from commercial enterprises that are trying to profit from information that is available, available to them through uh, Right to Know. In addition, Senate 552, which would grant school districts some measure of relief from vexatious requests for information under Right to Know regulations. That concludes my report, unless there are any questions. How do they define vexatious? A very good question. I will get back to you next time with a fulsome answer. <laughs> okay. Mr. Robinson, only if you know, are those requests typically procurement related? Procurement? I mean, which one on 312? The, of the entities seeking to profit by doing business with the district asking for information. I'm assuming that those are questions about past bids and things of that nature. I think it covers a wider, a wider area, Dr. Sullivan. But you know what? Let me run that down for you. I, there, there's, there's a way I can check. Thank you. All right. Uh, Lincoln Intermediate Unit, Ms. Ferrari. Uh, I have nothing from either the uh, LIU or the Joint Operating Authority at this moment. Um, and then under York Adams Academy, uh, I'm pleased that we continue to have 15 students in our 15 seats, which is very encouraging for this time of year. And we already have three students who are ready for June 2nd graduation. And it looks like we will be having some sort of modified graduation uh, for our students. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. York Adams Tax Bureau, Ms. Chichuli. No report. Okay, York County School of Technology, Ms. Schrader. Uh, yes, I wanted to let you guys know that uh, last week the School of Technology um, administered the NOCTI exams. These are the state mandated, um, according to school code, uh, tests for the vocational technical schools in the state. Um, it includes uh, skills tests as well as written tests. They administered tests to 367 seniors this year in 25 technical areas. So you can imagine this is a mammoth task. Um, they have volunteer experts from the community come in from local industries uh, and they administer the skills tests. Um, they followed COVID requirements, social distancing and all of that. Um, Apparently across the state, uh, many schools opted out of giving these tests uh, as they are allowed to do. But uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that the teachers and administrators really uh, stepped up to the plate and persevered through the whole process and were able to uh, give these tests because at the end of the day, the students really benefit from having taken these tests in some cases, depending upon the, um, the particular skill, they're actually, they actually earn a certificate that then they can take to potential employers uh, to prove that they, you know, have a certain skill level in their particular area. So I wanted to share, you know, I, I've become very um, fond of the School of Technology and, and have a, a great deal of respect for what they do there. And I wanted to share that with you to let you know that um, they managed to pull that off uh, this year in spite of, in spite of COVID. Uh, additionally, I would let you know that the new gymnasium that uh, has been under construction, they anticipate that to be uh, complete in the next couple of weeks. Um, so 
certainly by the next time, you know, next fall season, sports seasons roll around, hopefully that will be a, a facility that the, the whole community can benefit from. Unless you have questions, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. And you have a link to our activities report and also a link to our calendar online. I'd like to take this time to thank everybody that joined us online and sat through a meeting with us. And uh, Vince, do we have any more public comments? We do not. We do not, okay. Well, if there's no other issues, I would Mr. move that we adjourn. Mr. Pose now, just so yeah. everybody knows, there is apparently a super moon tonight. So go okay. out and see the moon. <laughs> okay, all right. And on that note, everybody, I will say good night. We are adjourned.